Hello and welcome to Deep Impact, a proud member of the Doof Network where we dive deep into Wildbo's most second work five years on. Coming up next is Elliot Diebold. And that was Ruben Morehouse. And we are back for Collateral 4.2. Yes. Uh, so Collateral 4.1 left with uh, Blake leaving with the nameless practitioner. And we start at the end of that uh, little driving trip, uh, Blake entering the Conquest's building, which is a kind of weirdly government looking building that just kind of seems off. Yeah. Um, I mean cuz we we've been told that conquest isn't limited to war and stuff and I think well we kind of get we kind of get sold on that more loose definition of conquest by the in, out, uh, by the exterior of his building. Mm. But I think the interior points in much more to the classic definition, but I'll talk about that when we get there. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, the exterior of the building kind of gets gives us the hint that we're going to get political and there's going to be some talk about um, oppressive governmental policies in Canada being the result of conquest. But <laughs> then when we get inside, it's it's all about war trophies. Um, yes. So Blake heads inside. He, he's allowed to bring June in. Um, these kind of bodyguards that Blake <laughs> isn't sure if they're others or humans are, are watching <laughs> outside. Um, and Blake kind of heads inside and passes through this room of... Of, of of trophies of conquests conquests i guess um <laughs> it, it it's yeah it's weird there's like he, he first notices it because this room is full of trophies and items that have zero connections they're just kind of stranded objects which is a very i don't know like creepy thing in the context of of what we've seen over the past three hours yeah and 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 then you know he he sort of looks around a bit more and notices a bunch of like ghosts and and, and stuff so it's that's what really clues him into the fact that yeah these are these are like trophies this is a trophy room um yeah and then then sh- it gets really weird from there because he starts going up the stairs and basically enters like an old school battlefield like the stairs become well, the, <laughs> the whole area becomes like ruins there's snow everywhere so somehow he's gone from inner building to like what appears to be like a, a a field, an old battlefield where there's like you know there's skulls with swords going through their heads and like it's yeah, uh he's, it, he, <laughs> he's still walking along this hallway that just seems so out of place. Um, yeah, it's it's the the rules have ch- have changed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's um you know we we go from weird government building to ah oh, like creepy you know serial killer trophy cabinet to yeah what the fuck <laughs> basically yeah um and we meet the lord of toronto uh yes he's a he's he's a colonialist basically um, yeah it makes he, sense he just looks like an old school colonialist guy uh which i guess makes sense um and he introduces us to the members of the council that have kind of shown up uh, the council of toronto so we have uh isadora who is a giant sphinx um <laughs> Creepy. Uh, Diana, who is a 30-something-year-old uh, well, astrologer. Well, I mean, she appears to be a 30-year-old astrologer. There are a lot of hints that that is not the case. <laughs> yes, that's fair. Um, and Jeremy. Oh, he's back so soon. Yeah, I did not see this um, coming. So uh, Blake gives the painting that he bought from Tiffany to, con- to Conquest as a gift, and it doesn't go over very well. Yeah, there was very much a sense that he got from the lawyers that, you know, it just needed to be a little token offering, and I guess he figured a painting would do, but, like, wow, Conquest gives him the fifth degree about it. Um, and, and there is, there's really a sense, like, I think Blake sort of thinks, oh, wow, I'm really out of my depth now, which is honestly yep. something you could have said since chapter 1.2. Um, <laughs> but it, it does feel like this is on another level. Like, we have a giant sphinx... Um, you know, this this Lord of Conquest who, you know, this isn't his domain, but he's just so powerful that he leaks into the whole area um, and infects yep. it with with himself so it basically becomes a domain. Um, yeah, this is this is sort of very intimidating uh, t- talking to this council. Yeah, um, and th- th- that kind of comes across through them grilling him about the painting and kind of discussing the theoretical implications of it. Um, Conquest is kind of putting forward that this is a gift freely given or purchased, and so therefore isn't a representation of Conquest. Um, and Blake is kind of desperately trying to bullshit his way into an answer and getting undercut by Conquest, just not buying it at any step of the way. Um, 
And I definitely get the feeling that Rose would do a lot better at this than Blake does. Like, she seems better at just kind of these bullshit wordplay things. Yeah, I mean, well, there's no mention of Rose at all in this chapter until the very end, but we'll get to that. Um, Yeah. Yeah, it's very much... It becomes pretty clear that Conquest wanted a gift that had something to do with Conquest, which I guess, you know, as someone who embodies the spirit of Conquest, it makes sense that he would want you to get Conquest or or to conquer something um yeah a- as a tribute to him um this is probably information the lawyers could have fed blake uh, i'm just saying <laughs> yeah, um, i mean they could kinda... have but maybe they didn't for a reason yeah yeah maybe uh but i i mean i wouldn't blame blake if he held this against them a bit because this seems like information it would have been nice for him to know yep um eventually though blake does uh kind of bullshit his way to a good enough justification and the lord of toronto accepts the gift and kind of starts this uh i guess impromptu council meeting for them all to kind of meet blake and and find out who he is um yeah i almost feel yeah. like the lord of toronto didn't even believe blake seeing it's just he made him scared enough to the point where it kind of felt like the lord of toronto conquered blake a bit on this gift thing <laughs> and just and, yes, and that uh, was that was his gift was being able to you know, do what he does to Blake. Yeah. um, I think he does that a fair amount. Like, that's kind of how he navigates conversations. It's all conversations are in some way um, argumentative, you know? Yeah. Yeah. He he definitely Um, definitely gives off that vibe. And and so then, you know, we open to this essential group grilling of Blake. Like, it moves just from the gift to everyone being able to grill him about any topic. Um, yep. And you get very strong vibes. So we've we've only got these three other members of the council here, but you've got uh, Isadora, the, the Sphinx, who's just, like, stone cold and, and kind of scary. Uh, yep. Diana is just flirting super hard with Blake, um, which is... Yep. She, she's she's the, both the comic relief and the only bit of... Uh, positivity Blake gets in this whole interaction. And then Jeremy is trying to pretend like he's not acting like explicitly against Blake, but does a pretty terrible job of hiding it. And we'll get, we'll get a bit yeah. more of that. Um, yeah, but it's, uh, I, I like how Blake, well, first of all, I like how Blake keeps calling everyone in Jeremy's harem very attractive. Um, it kind of contrasts <laughs> a bit with what, what Sandra felt. Um, yeah, but a bit creepy, actually, considering <laughs> that their standards of attractiveness might not live uh, up to what we think of in the modern day. I think these might be more the the back eye, like the ones he brought to the original meeting um, with the Duchamp. Yeah. Then yeah, then the nymphs. True. We don't. Yeah. But I uh, we don't know for sure. But I, 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 <laughs> it does make you wonder. Yeah. Yeah. True. I, I was more thinking. You know, Sandra could basically tell that they were weird, deformed monsters under some glamorous type thing, whereas Blake's just like, oh, cool, hot people um (laughs) yeah he doesn't put it together does he uh but yeah so what's really interesting is um as the council members are sort of bantering with each other one suggests that blake should go to one of jeremy's parties and and jeremy sort of like is like oh yeah no that'd be great or whatever um and blake really reacts poorly to this internally luckily he manages to keep it there but um i think there's been like sort of hints at this throughout the story and i think we skirted around it but I, i like i think this is sort of the story trying to make it clearer and clearer that like Blake has been like raped at some point, uh, essentially. Yeah. I, like that is yeah, at least some kind of sexual abuse. Yes. That, that is clearly a huge part of this trauma. And like, you know, this chapter is starting to bring it closer to the surface to the surface. And, um, you know, I guess that makes me nervous about where we might be going with it. Um, yeah. I um, mean, we kind of got a bit of it, uh, last chapter too, with a kind of three-way proposal that was mainly about helping people getting over hang-ups around physical intimacy. Yeah. Um, it, it does feel like that's a theme for this arc so far, is is bringing this a bit more to the forefront and allowing us to explore Blake's, you know, uh, trauma. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, and it, it, you know, he's coming back to Toronto, which is presumably maybe even where it happened, Um, because I think that's Mm. where he was essentially based the entire time he ran away from home. I don't know that for sure, actually. But, um, yeah, I mean, I I think, yeah, I I definitely think that this arc has been subtly hinting more specifically that that, um, sexual abuse is a key component in Blake's trauma. And, yeah, I think that's something to keep in mind as he is presumably going to blows against uh, a representative of the god of fertility and sex. 
Yeah, well, and also a, a Lord of Conquest whose yes. whole thing is domination, right? Like, Oof, yeah. I don't know. It's a bad combo, those two, <laughs> those yeah. two as antagonists. Um, so Isadora kind of asks Blake who he is, and suddenly he notices everyone else has gone pretty quiet. Um, <laughs> and putting two, two, two and two together, he realizes that this is a riddle. And so he uh, he just gives a bullshit answer again. Um, and it works. It seems to be the exact kind of answer that, that diffuses the situation. Um, well, he kind of because what's funny of, is hmm. he gives, like, the, the bullshit answer and they're sort of like, oh, you know, do, did someone tell you? And he's like, no, I figured it out. And they're like, well, then why did you say that? And he's like... Honestly, it, it was just kind of bullshit, and I thought if I was wrong, I'd at least get time to try and explain it and come up with more bullshit. And that's yeah. that's the bit that really sells him to Diana and, and Isadora. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's great. Yeah, Isadora kind of... I mean, she just set this trap where presumably if he failed, he would have been killed. Um, but Is- Isadora kind of warms up to him a bit. He kind of dodges a few of her other verbal traps, um, but then makes a misstep... Referencing the original story of the Sphinx, which uh, angers Isadora because it ends with the original Sphinx, her a- a set, uh, her ancestor or like mother even dying. Yeah, we get this. We get this tease at at Blake doing well in this council meeting, and then it's like yep. just as he starts to get momentum, bam! Uh, it all Oops. it all goes to shit. Um, yeah, I think I, I feel like a bit of a broken record at this point, but like all of the interactions in this are so fun. Um, yeah, ma- just having the mechanic where practitioners and others always have to speak the truth is just so it's so cool. Um, but because it's so well used in the story, like Wabo does so much with it. You know, this this could be very limiting in in the hands of someone who's not as good a wordsmith. Um, but you know, yeah. I, I almost I almost feel yeah, like I can't true. even spend the time calling out how great all the dialogue is. In, dialogue is in a scene because i feel like i'm doing that every episode well i i think blake even kind of falls into that exact same thing right he he has this thought of like i can see how being a practitioner would actually be fun for people <laughs> like we've gone from now he's in a place where only one person on the council is overtly planning to kill him <laughs> and the rest are all just kind of you know checking him out um it's it's fun and you can see blake kind of enjoying playing in the world a little bit not not too much of course because he is yeah. basically in constant danger but well, i mean we have to keep in mind blake is getting the very raw end of the introduction to this world like I, I, we had it made it a bit clear to us in those uh pages interludes that were about um you know from the textbooks 2.x uh it it seems like there are people who can just sort of casually get into this world and just sort of dabble almost like it's just a hobby um, and that's obviously not an option Blake has ever had. Um, he was really thrust into uh, the the high end of uh, of this table. But um, yeah, you, 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 we sort of have gotten hints that there is an ability to be a practitioner that isn't all life encompassing. Yeah, that isn't like you're risking your entire life all the time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So uh, after kind of Isadora is calmed down a bit uh, by Blake's like pulling some more good words smithing. Yeah, he just um, bullshits even more. Uh, yeah. She buys it. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. I mean, he kind of does well here, right? Uh, yeah. Anyway, um, Jeremy kind of is taking an unusual interest in Blake um, and and they, they kind of realise something's going on. Yeah. Uh, Jeremy seems to be... He basically says, I don't trust this guy. <laughs> and then that leads them down this path of going exactly where he wants them to. Yeah, he sort of manipulates things. So Isadora and and the, the Lord Conquest are, are kind of the ones sort of at each other's throats, which, you know, is probably very good for Jeremy. Um, I also love yeah. just as soon as Isadora and Conquest start sort of exchanging heated words, Blake's first thought is, oh, can I use this? Which is just, it, what a maniac. Like, and he then he directly ties it to what he tried in the council meeting, Jacob's Bell, which is like, thank God he did that, because yeah. that's exactly what this is. And he was about to do the exact same thing. And then he thinks, no, I probably shouldn't. You're like, oh, like thank God, Blake. <laughs> yeah, what? Because, you know, this line, oh, can I use this? It's in a paragraph all on its own. Like, it's just a, a one-sentence paragraph. And I read it, and I was just mm. like, oh, no, not again. Um and and yeah, so I'm glad he, he sort of learns restraint. And then he actually sort of says, Oh, you know, guys don't don't fight about me or whatever and they're like 
we're you know fucking hundreds of year old immortal beings <laughs> we're not gonna get in a fight over you uh which is pretty hilarious yeah, yeah. I'm glad you didn't make that move Blake. um <laughs> Uh, so the rest of the council kind of then pieces together who Blake is, that he is the next in line of the Thorburns, and uh, things go pretty badly here. Um, and Blake yes. kind of looks over, and Jeremy seems quite pleased with himself about this. Yeah, Blake essentially pieces together that, that Jeremy has orchestrated this. Um, I mean, yeah, I, I, <laughs> Jeremy didn't do a very good job of covering his... Uh, well, he wasn't subtle, um, and I guess he's not a subtle guy. He- um, yeah. but it, like, it, it's interesting cause we can, we come into this chapter knowing a lot more about Jeremy and, and his motivations and, and backstory than Blake does, but it kind of feels yeah. like the story just bridged that gap for us very quickly. Like rather than having, you know, a long dragged out like thing where we know more about Jeremy and, and Blake doesn't understand it. It was just sort of Blake has pieced together the important bits really quickly. And, and so we can just, <laughs> we can just work from essentially the same information, which is, which is nice. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Jeremy isn't subtle about his pleasure at what's happening, right? Like, <laughs> um, it, which is funny because he's he doesn't even really make any overt moves to manipulate this conversation. All he really does is say, oh, I don't trust Blake, he's not telling the whole story. Um, and then just kind of sits back and, and lets shit yeah, well, get stirred. No, I mean, he does that one thing. He says Isadora should be should be forced to ask Blake questions, and then she's all like, well, I'm not, like, your servant. <laughs> And then the Lord of Conquest, yeah. of course, has to call her out on that because it's the Lord of Conquest, and he's like, "But you do it for me," and, and yeah. yeah, and that's and that's obviously where it gets heated. So I, I think I think Jeremy actually does a pretty good job of playing the rest of the council members here. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Um, yeah. Anyway, so they've figured out who Blake is, and uh, Conquest uh, takes this information and runs with it. <laughs> He, he says, oh, you can summon demons? Well, I, I like the uh, the sound of having demons running around fucking shit up. Let's summon some demons, basically. Yes. Uh, and I love this sort of comes off the bit where, you know, they, they figure out Blake is a Diabolist, and before any of them can really respond, he's like, hey, look, I'm not, I'm not into that. Like, I'm not trying to do any of that. And that's the point where Conquest loses his shit. And I, like the first yeah. time I was reading this, I didn't really pass what it's in him off. I was like, what? what's going on? And, and and it took me a while to sort of put it together. And I was like, I, I don't understand why this is that. And then Conquest keeps talking. You're like, oh no, he wants Blake to be a Diabolus. Like, you know, yeah. and then of, of course, cause like demons causing pain, he can twist that around into, you know, Conquesty type things and, and it'll power him up. We've, we've already seen things like 9-11 power him up. So some demons yep. causing mayhem for hundreds of years, it's probably a good thing for him. Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, Conquest kind of goes from being a passive threat to an active one here. And there's a quote that I love and I want to pull out. Um, Conquest rose from his seat, which made for one hell of an understatement. <laughs> it, it's such a great line to just set up how imposing Conquest becomes and and how much the landscape shifts as Conquest's attitudes and motions shift. Yeah, well, um, he stands up and I think he gets like taller. Like, you know, we're in his sort of pseudo domain here so it's like he he morphs himself and the landscape at at his will essentially and and that makes him pretty terrifying yes uh so isadora and diana are not happy with this kind of saying to conquest we we're not going to go along with this um and they leave jeremy (laughs) makes a bargain saying yeah you can do that as long as you keep me and mine and the duchamps of jacob's bell safe um and conquest is like all right (laughs) um yeah, and so I think that's pretty much our confirmation that that Jeremy and Sandra are not quite as estranged, maybe as 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 I thought. Um, yeah, but uh, yeah, Isadora and Diana are basically against conquest now. They essentially say that they're going to be hostile towards him if he continues along this path. Which what Blake made it all of fifteen minutes in Toronto before setting off a fucking war, like. <laughs> Uh, I thought. Yeah, he. <laughs> I, I think my direct quote from like two episodes ago was Blake can come into Toronto and just be a bit of a nobody, and everybody won't be trying to kill him. And yep. that lasted about a chapter and a half. Yep. Yep. Uh, yep. Um, yeah, it goes bad, uh, <laughs> and it seems to go worse. Conquest turns to Blake and just kind of yanks Rose out into his domain. <laughs> um, <laughs> heavily implying that he's about to start torturing them and then says let us begin and that's how the chapter ends 
I mean, okay, so Blake got Rose out of the mirror. Like, yeah, right. victory. Fulfilled. Check that one off. <laughs> um, I mean, I'm assuming that this only applies to this sort of pseudo domain we have going. But- Why are you so pessimistic all the time, <laughs> Elliot? Huh? Maybe it'll all just work out for them. Uh, yep. <laughs> yep. That that winds up with what I've read of Wild Bow stories so far. Um, yeah. No, it, it would be a bit easy if this was just a permanent thing. But, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I want... This will... This will change things up a bit, I reckon. Um, the two of them both being in the same dimension. <laughs> yeah. Um, interestingly, uh, I want to call out... So, Blake has put two and two together that Jeremy was fucking with him this chapter. Yeah. But Jeremy says the, oh, keep the Duchamps of Jacob's Bell safe. And Blake doesn't seem to react to this or even notice it at all. It's, no, he... It's he, weird. He doesn't... I mean, I'm... He doesn't make a link in his narration, but... Uh, I mean, you know, this is Blake, you know, oh, my subconscious already realized at Thorburn. Um, so he, he may, he may even reference this line later as he passes it. Um, but yep, this is, de- de- that's this, true. this is definitely a, sort of a, a bit what I was talking about before, where now we're almost putting Blake on the same level we're at when it comes to information on Jeremy. Um, there's, we've probably got a bit more, but I think now Blake has access to all the key beats that he needs to understand what, how Jeremy will be interacting with him. Mm. Yeah, true. And that's the end of 4.2. Uh, what did you think of this chapter, Elliot, as a whole? <laughs> yep, uh, just another classic, packed, uh, casual conversation where Blake could die if he says anything slightly wrong. Um, <laughs> it, it was, yeah, it was great. Like, as I sort of said, I, this one really felt like the stakes were raised. Like, Blake has been about to die for most of the story so far, but this is the first time where it's sort of like even... Even just sort of being able to go back to the house or call the lawyers, you know, his safety blankets have all really been removed. And these guys are so much bigger and more intimidating than what he has faced thus far. Yeah, I don't know that they're necessarily more powerful, but they really seem more powerful, don't they? (laughs) Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, Yeah, it's a... we got a. We had one nice chapter where <laughs> but nice things happened to Blake, and I guess that we'll just have to be happy with that for a while because it seems like things are going to go worse again. Yeah. Yes, it does. I'm. I can't imagine this next chapter starts on a positive note. <laughs> um. So, for our bonus bit this uh this chapter, we wanted to do a bit of a deeper dive into the kind of law background of um some something that was mentioned this chapter, which is. The Greek god Dionysus. Yeah. Um, I mean, this is a bit of an excuse because we couldn't fit it into our Sandra Duchamp chapter, which because uh, that episode was too long already. Um, and the <laughs> word Dionysus was mentioned to this chapter, so it counts. Um, yep, it counts. It counts. <laughs> so Dionysus is the Greek god of, like, you know, grape harvesting, winemaking, and then, like, fertility, ecstasy, and then also madness and theatre were the two other ones. I don't think we've really seen directly de- mentioned impact so far but mm. kind of tie into that whole vibe of you know jezza and his whole crew mm. um yeah it, definitely it, seems like a good summary of their their overall attitudes yeah yeah definitely um so another little fun fact was uh dionysus is a is like in most stories is an outsider in the greek pantheon um because he's actually a, a demigod like his mother is mortal um and so you know i think part of that like Part of being caught between worlds is is him just you know being a bit of a hedonist, I guess. Um, and so his mm. his followers are all about like, oh, we're on the fringes because you know people can't accept us. Um, but also they were like drunk and having orgies all the time, so like you know they were probably just really full on to be around. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I like that uh, Dionysus as an outsider in the Greek pantheon kind of mirrors. Uh, Jeremy being this kind of seeming outsider in the Toronto Council. It's a nice bit of, like, a, a narrative link between him and his god. Yes, well, we've heard him almost described as a hermit, um, and so it sort of fits, um, you know, coterie aside. Um, <laughs> yep. Uh, so, you know, just a little tie back to the Sandra chapter. Um, in some versions of the Greek mythology, uh, Dionysus uh, sort of married Ariadne, Um it was obviously the the daughter of King Minos, um, so you know Minotaurs, Mazes, all that. So that whole bit about yep. Ariadne's thread in Sandra Duchamp's chapter um, is an even cooler little reference than I realised because you know it turns out Ariadne's directly tied to Dionysus. Yeah, 
yeah, it's it's a lot of uh, cool little weaving links back and forth between the, the Greek stories and Jeremy and Sandra's life. Yeah, yeah, you're right, it, it does. Um, and then, so just to, just to briefly cover the, I guess, the creatures of Dionysus we've seen so far. Um, so I'm pretty sure... The what, Coterie. Yeah, the, <laughs> the Coterie. So I'm pretty sure the, the uh, group he had with him, uh, he being Jeremy... Um, in the original meeting with the Duchamps and then at this council meeting were probably uh, Bacchae, uh, which was sort of referenced, and, and they were sort of the more evil of Jeremy's um, posse. Um, mm. that, that doesn't seem to be a real creature, as far as I can tell. Um, Bacchus was the name of the, like, you know, Roman ripoff of Dionysus, because, you know, like, all the Roman gods were basically ripoffs of, of the Greek ones. Yeah, if I had to kind of make a leap, I would say they kind of feel like this a cross between like succubus but like drunker i don't know <laughs> yeah yeah or yeah they they're even more siren-esque is is yeah um yeah true i still see more of them whereas the, the satyrs and, and nymphs that we saw in that in that interlude are also fairly spot on to you know the original greek mythology like satyrs are little sort of men with permanent erections they have some yep, so they have classic. some horse attributes depending on where you read. So you know they're they're just male fertility, and then yep. nymphs are sort of um, you know little sort of spirits that you know embody like places or uh, elements, and for some reason take the form of like really beautiful naked women because Greek <laughs> Greek mythology, I guess. Classic Greeks. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I'm interested to see if we get to explore uh, the coterie a bit more throughout our engagements with Jeremy. See, see if they take more of a, a forefront role as he kind of becomes more important. But I guess we'll see. Yeah, I'll be interested. This will be one of our first chances to see the same thing from two different perspectives. Impact, um, you know, see how Blake responds to them as opposed to uh, Sandra. Mm, yeah, yeah. Well, I, so you know, that's all I got on Dionysus. Uh, an interesting dive into kind of the history of this Greek god. I, I like, I don't know, I mean, with mythology, it's always weird thinking about, like, Judeo-Christian mythology, because I grew up in, a, like, a Christian household, and so that always feels like it should be separate from Greek mythology, but in a story like Pact, it's it's very fun having them all kind of play together in the same space. Yeah, um, oh, I honestly, it's, it's I, think, interesting. I think part of that as well, as well is... is... At least, uh, I want to say Western media, but maybe even particularly American. Um, you know, you see su- shows like Supernatural tend to treat Judo Christian um, mythology as separate to the others. Like, uh, yeah, like su- which is weird when you think about it. Yeah, uh, and, and you know, in, in particular, shows like Supernatural um, and, and a few others that I can think of, they stick very closely to the just a- Abrahamic religions in general. They don't draw specific ties to christianity or islam or Mm. or, um even like modern judaism uh and it's nice to see pact kind of not quite being afraid to cross that line or not cross the line not quite being afraid to touch that um that distinction every now and then but not really making a a big point of it either yeah it's it's a it's just it's fun exploring all these different mythologies right religious or otherwise um yeah it makes for a makes for you know an interesting <laughs> set of stories um anyway that's <laughs> that was a weird little <laughs> rant at the end there but that's uh, that's the end of our episode talking about collateral 4.2 um if you uh if you liked the sh- what you heard today why don't you check out our twitter it's uh media md podcast at media md podcast twitter uh so speaking of media md which is our is our other show uh we would have just had an episode of that launch uh yesterday uh, yep, that's at, just come out yesterday. And uh, we've got a special guest uh, prescribing our next thing, uh, which is Matt Freeman. So you can listen to the episode, and uh, he's at the end of that prescribing something for the next two weeks. Uh, of course, other yeah. doof, people familiar with the Doof Network will obviously know Matt from being the, the F in Doof. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you're unfamiliar with the with the format of Media MD, it's basically like a book club, but for not just books. Uh, <laughs> every fortnight, we will talk about a book, a TV show, a movie, something that somebody has prescribed. Usually, me or Elliot. Sometimes a uh, a special guest, and uh, then we'll talk about it again in a fortnight. Um, it's a fun show. You should check it out, uh, which you can do on from our Twitter or our website, Media MD Podcast. Or yeah, <laughs> yep. 
Um, and obviously, for more info on Deep Impact, uh, you can head to the Doof Media website, doofmedia.com. Yes, and if you'd like to support the show, you can check out the Patreon, patreon.com slash doofmedia. Um, it's very helpful to those of you who support us. Uh, it means that we're actually able to do this show to a high level of quality and kind of get some money and invest that into our recording setups and all kinds of things that help us make the show better. Definitely. Uh, Doof wouldn't be what it is today without all the Patreons. Um, it, you know, yep. it's it's fantastic. Um, and, you know, while we're talking about Patreon, Wildbo has one too, patreon.com slash Wildbo. So throw some money his way if you're enjoying his stories. Yeah, I mean, Doof Media wouldn't be what it is today without the Doof Patreon, for sure, but also without the Wildbo Patreon. Um, yeah. That enables Wildbo to write these incredible stories that we uh, love so much. Um, if you love these stories and you want to talk about them with us, uh, specifically this one, specifically this <laughs> chapter of this one, um, you can do that by heading to the discussion thread, which you will link in the uh, in the in the episode description for this episode. Yep. Uh, apart from that, we'll see everyone on Friday, the eighth of March, for four point three. Collateral four point three. We'll see you all then. Mm-hmm.